good morning. Welcome to Open Door Church. We are happy to have each and every one of you. It's so wonderful to be able to come in and see folks entering with a smile on their face, hopefully with joy in your hearts, and, and we just pray that God will minister to your needs today. Each of us, as we come into the Lord's house, it is always a matter of us uh, coming not as perfect individuals, because none of us are, not as people who have had a week to where that everything has gone well, because it seems that they never do, but as people who need to hear from the Lord, as people who need to worship the Lord. And so that's why we're here, and we're going to open our mouths and sing God's praises, open His book, and hear what it is that He has to say to us. And so this morning, I want to read a few verses out of the book of Isaiah, chapter 59, where the Word of God says this, A Redeemer will come to Zion, and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, declares the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit which is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your offspring, nor from the mouth of your offspring's offspring, says the Lord, from now and forever. Let's bow together for prayer. Almighty God, as we bow before you now, we thank you, dear God, for your many blessings. We thank you that you've given us your word and that your word does not change. We thank you that that which was written of old is still there for instruction to us. And Lord, today as we consider your words, I pray that, Lord, we would receive them not as words that are to be just considered, but as words that are to be welcomed. Lord, I pray that you'll bless each individual who is here. Father, that you will meet them in their needs and draw them to yourself. I ask that as we sing praises to you, that you will receive those praises and you'll be glorified in them. We give you the thanks for all of your blessings and all the joys that you give us for our families, for our strength. And we just ask today that you would be honored. For we pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning. Let me ask you a question. How many of you ever been to the doctor? You ever been to the doctor? You ever been to see a doctor? Yeah, I went to Dr. Alvin. You did? Okay, you went to see a doctor. Let me ask you something. What does that doctor do when you're not there? What does that doctor do when you're not there? We just sit. We just sit. We just sit. What does he do when we're not there, though? When we're out playing, when we're... Uh, doing what we do, going to school. What does he do? Does he just sit there and sit and wait and do nothing? What do you think? He checks other people who come to the doctor's office. Okay, so he has other people who need to see him, right? And so do you think doctors stay pretty busy? Yeah, why? Because everybody needs a doctor, don't they? Now, whenever you've been to the doctor, maybe you went because you just needed a checkup, but maybe you went because you were... Why did you go? Hey, guys. Why did, why did you go? Did you go because you were sick? Have you ever been because you were sick? Yeah. And when you told Mama you didn't feel well, what did she do? Just get medicine. She what? Just get medicine. You just get medicine, that's right. Did Mama ever do this? Did she ever pull out something like this and take your temperature? Because mm -hmm. sometimes when we're sick... Mamas want to know just how sick we are, and so they'll take this and they see how much, see if you've got a fever, okay? Because if you've got a fever, that means that you're pretty sick, isn't it? And when you get to the doctor, what does the doctor do? The nurse or the doctor, you know what they'll do? They'll check your temperature too to see just if you're being sick. And they'll do something else, you know? They have these things that they put in their ears, and it has, has this thing on the end, and they'll, they'll put it on your chest. What's that called? What's that called? Does anybody know? A pen. a pen? No, that's not a pen. You just wanted me to say that word, didn't you? No. Okay. Um, what is it, huh? A scope. A scope. That's pretty good. I just thought it was a listening to the heart thing. But, uh, but you're right. It's a kind of a scope. They call it a stethoscope. And they do that so that they can check your heart and make sure that it's beating just right and make sure everything is okay. 
You have no idea why they do that? Okay. Well, they do a lot of things. I don't have any idea why they're doing it, but, uh, but they do. Okay? Do you know what Jesus said? You know what, Je what did you want to say? Jesus said, come and live in the water. Come and? Come and live in the water. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I don't remember where he said that, but that's good. That's good to know. Now, do you know what Jesus said? Jesus said that he was like, Jesus said he was like a doctor. Do you know that? He said he was like a doctor, and people need to, people, he's there for people who think they need him. Okay? There's some people that think they never need a doctor. Did you know that? They say, oh, I'll be all right. I don't need a doctor. It doesn't matter. I've got a fever. It doesn't matter. I'm feeling bad. I don't need a doctor. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Bad. That's a bad thing. If you're sick, you need, might need a doctor. Okay? And there's some people that say, I don't need Jesus. Do you know that? But do you know what? Do they need Jesus? What do you think? Now, for somebody here today that thinks, I don't need Jesus, are they right or wrong? wrong. They're, they're what? Wrong. They're wrong. Everybody needs Jesus. And Jesus says He's there to help people who know that they need Him. And so let's pray to Him right now. All of us need Jesus. And you're going to go and learn about somebody today that my guess is it's somebody that uh, Jesus had a special relationship with. And so let's bow together for prayer and then you can go to Children's Church. Everybody bow your heads. Close your eyes. Let's just talk to God and not to each other. Okay? Bow your heads. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the children. We thank you for the teachers and for the privilege that uh, these teachers have to be able to share your word with the kids. We pray that you'll bless them as they go. And Lord, may you be the one who is honored in each of our lives today. Bless the children. Help them be obedient to their teachers. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you guys in the lineup, go to Children's Church. Amen. This morning our text is going to be found in the Gospel of Mark. In chapter 2, as we get ready to look into it, always when I open up a passage of Scripture and read it, I don't want to read it just for history. I don't want to read it just to find out what took place then. But I want to read the Word of God so that I can find out about what that has to say to us right now. You know, I believe the Word of God is eternal, and I believe it has a lesson for us in everything that we find. And so with that understanding, we search the Scriptures to see what God has said. Now, folks, I would think that uh, if you notice what's going on around you, you realize we live in a troubled world that is filled with troubled people. The story of this generation, the storyline of this generation is one characterized by an appetite so consuming that every attempt to satisfy it seems to simply end in a greater desire and a deeper despair. The sorrow and the loneliness run so deep that escape seems hopeless. Well, I want you to know this is not the first generation that that has been true. In fact, that plight of man is as old as man. What I'm going to be sharing with you out of the life of Christ today is something that if you take that and, and take these same truths as far as the way God revealed Himself in the Old Testament, what we need from Jesus and how we need to respond to Jesus is the same way that Israel needed to respond to Holy God there in the Old Testament. And so I want to share with you, I want to begin this morning by reading to you some verses that I want you to listen to. They are found in Isaiah chapter 59. They are applicable to, the, to today just as they were in that day. And I want to share these things with you. I believe the words are there on the screen so you can follow along with me. The first thing I find in this passage of Scripture, and this is all just introduction, is that the people of our world are troubled, and the same was true in that day. Listen beginning in verse 8. It says, they do not know the way of peace. And there is no justice in their tracks. They have made their paths crooked. Whoever treads on them does not know peace. Therefore, justice is far from us. 
and righteousness does not overtake us. We hope for light, but behold darkness for brightness, but we walk in gloom. We grope along the wall like blind men. We grope like those who have no eyes. We stumble at midday as in the twilight. Among those who are vigorous, we are like dead men. All of us growl like bears and moan sadly like doves. We hope for justice, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far from us. People of our world are troubled, even as they were in the day of Isaiah. Then notice, continuing, we find there in the prophet that it's a truth that God has been ignored and He has been offended. For it says in verse 12, For our transgressions are multiplied before you, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and we know our iniquities. Transgressing and denying the Lord, and turning away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving in and uttering from the heart lying words. Justice is turned back, and righteousness stands far away. For truth has stumbled in the street, and uprightness cannot enter. Yes, truth is lacking. And he who turns aside from evil makes himself a prey. Now the Lord saw, and it was displeasing in his sight, that there was no justice. So what does God do? God does what He does. And we see the truth that God will respond to the situation in righteousness. For it says in verse 16, And He saw that there was no man, and was astonished there was no one to intercede. And then His own arm brought salvation to Him, and His righteousness upheld Him. He put on righteousness like a breastplate, and a helmet of salvation on His head. And He put on garments of vengeance for clothing, and wrapped Himself with zeal as a mantle. According to their deeds, so he will repay. Wrath to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. To the coastlands he will make recompense. So they will fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. For he will come like a rushing stream which the wind of the Lord drives. You see, God will respond to the situation of man. And he responds in righteousness. But oh, what glory we see even here in the Old Testament where it tells us that God has provided a remedy. It says, beginning in verse 20, a Redeemer, a Redeemer will come to Zion. And to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, declares the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit which is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your offspring, nor from the mouth of your offspring's offspring, says the Lord, from now and forever. What is he telling us? He is telling us that he understood the situation in Israel and that God did something about it. He is telling us that He understands the situation in our world and God has done something about it. He is telling us that there is comfort for the troubled heart. There is one who can satisfy the longings of the desperate and despondent. The hope rests ultimately not in man. Man thinks that somehow he's going to solve his own problems, but all man does is continue to get himself deeper and deeper in despair and difficulty because he has turned away from the one true God. But you see, there is one who can satisfy those longings. The hope of Israel rested ultimately in the one who was called the Messiah, the one who is the Redeemer, that one that we know is Jesus Christ. But people must hear Him in order that they might turn away from their own path and trust in Him. From whom will we hear? Well, He tells us it will be from the person who listens to God. From that person who, in whom the Holy Spirit abides. And that person, he says, must speak the words that he puts in our mouths, words of truth, words of forgiveness, words of hope, and words of salvation. 
Now you have heard it said that people in our day are indifferent to the gospel, that we are wasting our breath to tell them of Jesus. Is that true? Well, for the most part, we don't know whether it's true or not because most have never heard a clear presentation of the gospel to which they can be indifferent. Many argue today that we must repackage the truth and present the gospel in new and different ways. That we must change it so that it is attractive to man, so that it meets the desires that that man has. But let me remind you, the person who is not yet converted, that is a person who is responding in the flesh. So do we take the Word of God and make it into the Word of man so that somehow they might receive it? Is that true? Well, to begin with, I would think that the thought of forgiveness would be attractive to anyone. I don't know how you need to dress that up. I don't know how you need to change that to tell somebody with all that you have done, with everything that has been true in your life, with all that has happened in your life, and however you have failed God, that you can be forgiven. I want to tell you that is still the message that we need to preach and we need to share with people today. But when we do so, that message of forgiveness has to have in it a message of repentance as well. Because you can't be forgiven unless you come to God in repentance. Just like you can't go to a doctor unless you know that you are sick. You can't come to God unless you know that there is something that is wrong in your life. Verse 20 in Isaiah 59 says, A Redeemer will come to Zion and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, declares the Lord. God didn't say to Israel that He was going to send a Redeemer who would fit in with their lifestyle. He did not say that the prophet was to preach what would be received by the masses. He was to preach that which the Holy Spirit put in His mouth. So why is it that today we would think that the Holy Spirit of God would change His message, that He would somehow soften the appeal? Will the Holy Spirit continue with what He has always done? Will He still do the work of the Holy Spirit? Spirit? He will. He will. Jesus said that He would. In fact, in John 16, 8, it says, and He, talking about the Spirit, when He comes, what will He do? He will convict the world. What does that mean? He's going to convince the world. Concerning what? Concerning sin. Why do you start there? Why begin there? Because a person will never come to a doctor unless he knows that he is sick, and a person will never come to Jesus unless he knows that there is something dreadfully wrong within his own life. That he is a sinner. He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness. Only Jesus is righteous. But He will convince us of the righteousness that there is a standard that we must meet. And He will convince us of judgment to come. That all of us are going to stand before God and give account to Him. Now that is what the work of the Holy Spirit is. And so if we are to preach the Word of God, if we are to share the Word of God, if we are to share the truth of God with other people, we've got to give the Holy Spirit something He can work with. Because He's not going to work with something fluffy and, and like cotton candy. You know, He's not going to work with a gospel that's just, just all fluff. He can work with a gospel that is true and packed with truth. Let me ask you this morning, as we think about the world and we think about what, was, what is going on, as we think back to Israel, could God have made a difference in the life of those people? Yes, He did. Yes, He could. And He did whenever they turned to Him in repentance, whenever they turned and put their faith once again, again in Him, they responded. And God blessed. Can Jesus make a difference in our world? If he can't, nobody can. But indeed, he can. Let me ask you, can he make a difference in your life? You say, well, he has. Well, I trust that he has. But I believe that there are those here today who need for him to make a greater difference in our lives. And the problem that we have, the reason that we feel so distanced from him, the reason we don't sense always his presence with us, it's not because somehow he has gone on vacation, he has gone away, and he's not available to us. 
It is because you and I have not responded to Him. We have not desired to spend that time with Him. So He has a purpose for us. If you haven't done so already, open your Bible to Mark chapter 2, verse 13. From this text, I want to share with you five things that you need to do in order for Jesus to make a difference in your life. We want Him to make a difference in our world. Well, let's start with us. How can Jesus make a difference in your life? Now, I believe you can apply this to others, but this is not so that you can take these five points and go out and hit somebody else with them. This is so that you might apply them in your life, so that a change might take place, so that when people see you, you they say, I want what he or she has. Because they have a living faith, because they have a vibrant faith, because there is something different in them. They are not just religious. They are people in whom Jesus has made a difference. So, let's begin. I want you to hear that Jesus can make a difference if you are willing to listen to Him. Have you ever had that time where you were trying to tell somebody, especially a child when they were in your home, and they, you're talking to them, and they're, you know their mind is somewhere else, you know that their thoughts are somewhere else, maybe they're paying attention to something else, and you say to that child, gently, I am sure, would you listen to me? And what do moms do? They say, look in my eyes, look right here, because you want their attention. Do you know what? Jesus can make a difference if you are willing to listen to Him. Look at verse 13. It says, He went out again by the seashore, and all the people were coming to Him, and He was teaching them. Did you hear that? Look at it for yourself. Mark wrote and said, and all... That's a big word. All the people were coming to Him. Now, surely that is not what he meant to say. All the people were coming to Jesus. Well, that's what Scripture says. All the people had an interest in him, whatever their interest might have been. All came to hear what he was teaching, whether they came that they might learn or whether they came in order that they might somehow challenge what he had to say. But I want you to know Jesus made a difference in all of their lives because he was teaching them. Now, that's one of the first ways that Jesus makes a difference in a person's life. When you are willing to listen, He is willing to teach. And we know that even like that little child needs to learn, and every one of us is the children of God, what do we need to do? We need to continuously learn. We need to listen to Him. One of the first things that I had to learn as a pastor was that I couldn't force feed anyone with the Scripture. You know, I can't, I, I can't force it on them and, and, you know, stay after them, browbeat them and say, you're going to take this because it's good for you. No, I can't force feed anybody. And I find that people have a certain amount of desire to hear, but when their desire runs out, I might as well shut up because there's not that teachable moment any longer. And so if all of you want me to shut up, all you need to do is just pay attention to something else and start looking somewhere else and just, you know, look at your iPhone or whatever you want to do, and I'll get to the point and we'll just stop. Because it does me no good to teach if people aren't listening. Now, I know you're not going to do that. I've been with you too long to think that you're going to do something like that. Well, it may be that you are having problems in your life because you have not taken the opportunities, you've not taken the, the advantage of the opportunities to hear from God. There are so many people who profess faith in Christ that their Bible lays unopen from Sunday afternoon all the way till Sunday morning. I mean, most of the week the Bible is there. They get up on Sunday morning and they say, I might need my Bible today. Where did I put it? Not listening to God. People wait until their problems are seemingly insurmountable and then they might perk their ears up and say, is there anything in the Word of God for me? Is there anything there? Well, let me say to you that Jesus makes a difference in the lives of those who are willing to listen. So this may be the problem if He is not making a difference in your life. And this is certainly the problem with most people who say that they are believers. They say with their mouth that they believe, but they don't say it with their ears. 
Because if you believe in Jesus and you believe that he's a great teacher and you believe that he has the answers for all of life, what are you going to do? You're going to listen to him. Not just tell people that you believe in him, but listen to him. Now this morning and every Sunday morning at 9 a.m., the Word of God goes out to the people of this area on a secular radio station, WSBS. Many people did not hear this morning what was shared. Now maybe it was because they had their radio turned off, like I do most of the time. Maybe it was because they were tuned in to a different station. Well, may I say to you that God is speaking into our lives. Most have not responded to Him in faith, and so their spiritual radios are turned off and they cannot hear. And the majority of those who have put their faith in Jesus do not respond. Why? Because they're tuned in to a different station. If you're not tuned in to Jesus, there's a problem. You see, they're listening for a message that pleases them rather than a message that pleases Him. Let me say to you again that Jesus can make a difference in your life if you're willing to listen to Him. How wonderful it would be if all the people were coming to Him and He was teaching them. But even if others do not come to Him to be taught, you and I can make sure that we do. And open our ears to Him and let Him teach us. Open His book and see what it is that he has to say to us. Second thing I would say to you out of this text is that Jesus can make a difference if you are willing to learn from him. Look at verse 14. It says, As he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. What did he do? And he got up and followed him. Now, what was Levi doing before Jesus called him? You know what he was doing? He was taking care of business. His business happened to be the collection of taxes. Now, no matter what you've heard about being a tax collector, I'm here to tell you by personal experience three things about it. Number one, it is not as glamorous as you might think to be a tax collector. If you've ever thought that was a glamorous job, that you like to be in the position of telling people what they had to pay... I want you to know it's not as much fun as you think it is. It's not as glamorous as you think it is. Been there, done that, it's not. Second thing is that not all tax collectors are cheats and crooks. They're not. They're not. So don't look at Levi and paint him with the same picture, same paintbrush that you might paint Zacchaeus before he was saved. Thirdly, you're not likely to get rich doing it. Okay? Being a tax collector. There were some who did because they were crooked, but others it was just a job. Now those three things are not only true today, uh, true today they were true then. They were not only true then, they, were also, they are also true today. So Levi's work was to sit in a tax booth. Now in this case, it was by the Sea of Galilee where a tax was charged to transport persons and goods across the lake. I mean, any way you can tax people, you just tax them, right? They'll find a way to get your money. It's like driving down the highway and you have to keep stopping and stopping and stopping and stopping. I'm going to tell you, I made a trip to Toronto and then I made a trip to Baltimore all in the same month. I got my statement from Easy Pass and I said, oh my goodness gracious. Oh my goodness gracious, what are we going to sell to pay this? I mean, you know, just to travel cost you a fortune. Well, it was the same thing in that day. Him being a tax collector made him a publican. Not a republican, a publican. Now some people today would call, them, call him a revenuer. But those Jewish folks, more they, they called him a publican and they kind of spit the word out when they said it. It was distasteful for them to even say the word publican. That was, that was a terrible thing. It left a bad taste in their mouth. Now the publicans, as collectors of taxes, due to the Roman government, the fact that they were collecting these taxes for the Roman government, it made the tax collectors to be distasteful, to be somewhat obnoxious to the people of Israel, to the Jews. You see, the Jews did not like living under the yoke of a foreign country and disliked whatever reminded them that they were living under that Roman government. We know that many of the publicans were exceedingly dishonest, that all of them seemed to have been despised. 
And you know, if Jesus had selected his disciples in the way that, say, a presidential candidate selects his vice president, trying to find somebody that'll gain him popularity, then he chose the wrong people. To have that opportunity to call anyone to follow you, to reach out and call Levi, who would later be called Matthew, to call him to be your follower when he's been a publican, Jesus certainly wasn't doing it for the sake of popularity. What was Jesus calling upon Levi to do? Not to make Jesus more popular, but he was calling on him to be his what? His disciple, his follower. That's what he was calling him to be. That meant what? It meant that he wanted Levi to be with him and to learn from him. This man, Levi or Matthew. Now you certainly remember that he, would, he was and would become the writer of the first gospel about the life of Jesus. You can clearly see in his life that Jesus made a profound difference in Matthew as he was willing to leave his former occupation and learn from Jesus. May I say that Jesus will still make a profound difference in your life if you are willing to step out in faith, choosing to be with Him. Choosing that is your most important opportunity, your most important work. What is the most important thing in your life? For some people, it is whatever they do to earn a living. That is, that is it. And they make all their decisions based upon career. They make all their decisions, what is good for me as in a business. And I believe that God wants to bless us, but I believe He wants our first business to be learning from Him. Learning from Him. Choosing Him. Choosing to be His follower. Somehow those who have put their faith in Jesus as Savior have become convinced that becoming His disciple is optional. Are you listening to me? You can accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and then, you know, a few of us are going to take the step of being His disciples, to be His followers, that that is optional. Most people who say, I am a believer, would confess that they are not disciples of Jesus. And thus it is no wonder that their lives are very little different from the lives of the people around them who also are not disciples, but they are not believers either. But their lives of the two are very close to the same. I suppose that Levi could have said to the Lord, Lord, I believe that you are the Redeemer who was to come into this world, but... I'm sure that you don't mind if I just keep on with my life. I promise to try to be a better person, but I am not sure I'm ready for this disciple thing. Does that sound like believers of our day? Not sure I want to be a disciple. Now what if he had responded in that way? Then he would have been like those that he spoke of, that he quoted Jesus in his gospel about, when Jesus said in Matthew 10, 38, And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Jesus didn't think much of believers who said, I'm not willing to be your follower. I just wanted heaven. I didn't want your will to be done on earth in my life. There's a third thing I want to say to you. You can take that and soak it in, but I need to move on. The third thing is this. Jesus can make a difference if you are willing to lounge with Him. Does that sound better? To lounge with Him. Look at verse 15. It says, And it happened that He was reclining at the table in His house, and many tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus and His disciples, for there were many of them, and they were following Him. What were they doing? They were dining with Jesus. They were reclining at the table with Jesus. Now that sounds a whole lot better to most of us to do something like that. And that doesn't sound very hard. Yet there are many who refuse to do so. You know, it was Matthew who recorded the words of Jesus when Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I'll give you rest. He said, Take my yoke upon you and do what? 
learn of me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. And then he said this, And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My burden's light. In John 15, verses 4 and 5, we also read the words of Jesus, where Jesus said, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. Then he said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. You know, there's a lot of people stressing and pressing, trying to do something for God, when what God wants you to do is to lounge with Him. What He wants you to do is relax with Him. He wants you to get to know Him more than anything else. Now, maybe you've never thought about abiding in Christ as lounging with Him, but Jesus was certainly pointing to a relationship in which He supplies all of our needs and we benefit simply from remaining closely connected to Him. Many tax collectors and sinners relaxed and dined with Jesus. However, many of us who consider ourselves to be followers of the Lord Jesus Christ take very little time to do so. And then we wonder what's wrong with our lives. We wonder what's wrong with our lives. One of my favorite authors is a man by the name of Henry Blackaby. The reason he's one of my favorite authors is because he doesn't just write about a relationship with God, he lives a relationship with God. I can tell you that by first-hand experience. One of his books, one entitled Created to Be God's Friend, did you hear that? Didn't that sound good? Created to be God's what? His friend. He wrote on the dedication page these words. He said, To the many of God's people who are searching for a full intimacy with God and who desire to know in their experience the eternal purpose of God being manifested in and through their lives. Now that's how you have a full intimacy with God. You desire to know Him. You desire to know Him by experience. You desire as well to know His eternal purpose and live out that purpose. Let me say to you that full intimacy with God can only be found as we carve out and protect some time in our days for doing nothing other than lounging with Jesus. True or false? Are you agreeing with me? Just lounging with Jesus. Just spend some time with the Lord. Open His Word and relax. Get on your knees and just spend some time in His presence. And I want to tell you, it will make a difference in your life. You see, if Jesus, surely if He allowed tax collectors and sinners to lounge with Him, He would allow us to do the same. I'm afraid that there are many who take seriously the call to be disciples who fall short in this area of lounging with Him. Instead, we allow our relationship with Him to be one of doing rather than one of spending time with our Lord. Remember that in regard to Jesus calling His disciples in Mark 3, verse 14, that it says this, And He appointed twelve so that they would be with Him and that He could send them out. So, but note that the first thing was what? That they could be with Him. That's the first thing. Lounge with Jesus. You want to say just hang out with Jesus. Focus your heart on Him. Spend some time in His presence. The fourth thing is this. Jesus can make a difference if you're willing to lose to Him. Verse 16 says, When the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, Why is he eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? Why? Now, what was the problem with these religious somebodies, these scribes? You know what was the problem? They were unwilling to, to lose their lives to Jesus. 
in doing so, they would have had to have set aside their own self-righteousness. They would have had to acknowledge Jesus as everything and themselves as nothing. Now, friends, the more you get to know Jesus, the more you'll realize how great He is and how small you are. But what a privilege that we can hang out with Him. What a privilege we can have a relationship with Him. In Matthew 16, verses 24 to 26, we read these words. It says, Then Jesus said to His disciples, If anyone wishes to come after Me to be My disciple, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? If all there is about your life is your life, you're going to end up losing everything. But if, all, if the thing that is most important to you in your life is the Lord Jesus Christ so that the things that you would desire are set aside. In fact, what happens in your heart is you begin to desire Him more and more and more. And what a joy that is. You see, the Christian life is about you in your relationship with Jesus. It is not about what He's doing in the life of someone else. It is about you surrendering to Him. It is about you accepting your circumstances. It is about you turning loose of the steering wheel and letting Him be in control. Hard thing for us, but I highly recommend it. Let me quote Henry Blackaby's book that I mentioned earlier. He said this. He said, in my own life, as I have studied the Scriptures, I have believed I was always, listen to this, face to face with God. When you open the book, is that what you're realizing? You're opening it. You're face to face with God. He said, His Spirit is always present, doing what the Father assigned for Him to do with me. Teach me, guide me, and enable me in my personal walk with God. So I knew He alone could reveal God's purposes and ways to me. And when He did, I knew that I must obey and do it with a deep and personal relationship of love with Him. As I have done this over many years, I have never known God to fail me or leave me, but always to enable me. And so backtrack in that. And if you want Him to enable you, to never leave you, to never fail you, then... You obey Him. You spend time with Him. You let Him be what your life is about. You see, you have a choice whether you will resist the Lord and question all that He does or whether you will accept the fact that you have to yield to Him and surrender to Him. In other words, lose to Him. He will lay down your life for His sake. No greater joy than that. Fifth thing is this. Jesus can make a difference if you're willing to lean on Him. Here's where it says in verse 17, And hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So when can a doctor help you? It's only when you're willing to admit that you need His help. Now, right now, I'm in need not of a doctor, but of a dentist. I broke a tooth. All right. I guess, you know, eventually those things just give up. You know, maybe I put, put too much in there for it to chew on. But it broke in half. And it's not hurting me. And so uh, it was one that had been worked on before. I guess they took all the life out of it. It's not hurting me. So I asked I ask, uh, Brother Eric, I said, well, can I just leave that thing in there? It's not hurting me. It's not doing, doing me any harm. Maybe smooth it off a little bit and just leave it like it is. He said, no, Pastor, you need to go see this person who can help you because that tooth is compromised. And if you don't get them help you, then I'll be taking it out of there one of these days and you need every tooth you have, all right? So I guess I'll take that advice and I'll go to the dentist. You see, they're there for a purpose, and when we need them, we don't need to think we can do without them. And yet, mo while most of us will go to the dentist, we'll go to the doctor whenever we need to do so for our own good, yet still Jesus 
We just go on our way. And we think I'm happy enough. Everything's good enough. So we don't admit our need. But He can't help you until you're willing to lean on Him, until you're willing to say, I need His help. I would like to convince you that you need His help so that you will turn to Him. I would like to convince you, but I know that is not my job. That is the work of the Holy Spirit of God. But let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit of God has been busy doing His work in your life already. He has been and He continues working to convince you that what you need more than anything else is to turn to Jesus. So if you're here and you've never done that, that is the most important thing that there is because that's eternity. You need to stop trusting in you and stop trusting in your ceremony and your religion and start trusting only in Jesus. You see, you need to take to Him and surrender all of your spiritual aches and spiritual pains. Now, a person remains separated from God. Why? Because their stubborn pride keeps them from accepting their truth about themselves. They don't want to believe that there is anything that they need. And somehow, they want to believe. People seem to want to believe that there's nothing they can do to please God. People will say, well, you know, that's great for you, but I can never live that way. And they seem to be satisfied with that. Somehow that gives them an out. Somehow that gives them an excuse. But they don't want to believe that they can receive by grace that which they could never earn for themselves. Now, it may be that somebody right here, right now, needs to accept the truth about themselves, how desperately wicked it is to refuse to turn to Jesus. That's the most wicked thing you can do. God sent His own Son into the world to die on a cross, and then for us to say, I don't need that. I'm doing all right all by myself. What a wicked thing that is. Now, a believer's real problems arise when that person begins to think that they can handle life on their own and make decisions on their own. And somehow now that he's kind of got them jump-started, you know, he gave you eternal life so you know you're going down the right road. Now, you know, the hills, when you get to the hills in the road, then you say, okay, Lord, I need a push. I need you to help me up this hill. I'm in a difficult spot. But he gets you up the hill, and then you begin to coast down the other side, and you say, that's all right. I'm good on my own for a while. And believers go through their life. Oh, life is great. I'm coasting all is well. Until they get to the next hill. And they left their relationship with Jesus back at the top of the other hill. And they can never go up. And we see it over and over and over and over. When they're to the point in the hill, they begin to look around saying, Who can help me? And we say to them, Jesus can help you, and He can. But there's a lot better way. And that is to live your life with Jesus. And in every hill that you have to climb, you know what that is? That's an opportunity for Him to show how powerful and how mighty He is in your life and bring glory to Himself. Can Jesus make a difference in your life? What would you say? Can He or not? He can. He can. He can make a difference in your life, and He can make a difference in this world. Jesus Christ came as the Son of God to do the will of God. That culminated in Him giving His life on the cross of Calvary to pay for all of our sins. He has come that He might release us from the power that Satan has over us. And so in every situation, I'm not a, I don't know if I'm a great counselor or a poor counselor. You know all I know to do? Point people to Jesus best I can. That's the best I can do. Now I want to listen, I want to hear, I want to help as best as I can, but ultimately it all comes down to that. Friend, Jesus is the one that can help you. I can't give you any words of advice that He's the one. Turn to Him. You need Him. He can make a difference. This morning, we're going to close our worship service 
by taking part in communion, by taking part in this which Jesus told us. He said, do this to remember me. And I believe it's important for a, for a church to do this. Number one, He commanded it. Number two, it reminds us that if He had not given His body to sacrifice on the cross and shed His blood, that we would have no hope whatsoever. That we remember Him and what He did. Now, He died in order that you might have fellowship with Him. He died in order that you might be forgiven of your sins. He died in order that you might be able to live forever in heaven with Almighty God. And we live having put our faith and trust in Christ in order that we might bring glory and honor to Him. Now, the Scripture tells us that we should never come to this point in the Lord's Supper and do this in an unworthy fashion. None of us are worthy of what Jesus did for us. I don't think you ever can be. But don't do it in an unworthy fashion. You know what that means? That means if Jesus is not in control of your life right now, if there's something where you've said, you, you put that arm out there and you said, stay your distance, keep your distance. I know what you want from me, but I am unwilling to do that. If you put that stiff arm out against God, then I don't know how you can glorify the Lord in, in the Lord's Supper. None of us are perfect, but we can have our sins confessed. If He's shown us sin in our life, we can have that confessed before Him. We can just let Him be daily cleansing us of our sins. We're not going to be perfect till we get to glory. And so don't think you have to be sinless, but you can be obedient. So if there's something in your life that needs to be settled with the Lord, it may be just a matter of saying, God, I will. It may be a matter of you saying, God, I won't do that any longer. It may be a matter of you saying, Lord, I understand better today than I've understood in a while, and I know that I've drifted away from you. I know I'm not where I need to be. I want you in my life. I'm going to ask that you bow your heads, close your eyes. This is a time for you to get alone with God. It's a time for you to ask Him what He would have you to do. It is a time not for you to listen to me, but to listen to Him. Now, I'll be here at the front, and if there's anybody who has any need that I can pray with you, I can never pray for you. You can pray for yourself. But if I need to pray with you about something, then I am more than glad to do that. So, right now is a time of decision. Right now is a time of opportunity before we come to this part of participating in the Lord's Supper.